Ben. I'm the director of the Medieval and Renaissance Studies program, which is sponsoring this wonderful event. And a couple of announcements. First, uh, if you are here for Professor Borden's class or Professor Stage's class, there is a sign-up sheet right where that lovely young woman is signing. And we have information about the Medieval and Renaissance Studies program right in the same place. We have this flyer, so pick one up. We would be delighted to have you know more about the program. Also, if you're here, I think you might be very interested in witches. And I am teaching in the pre-session, Saints, Witches, and Mad Women. This is the pre-session. It's History or Medieval and Renaissance Studies or Women and Gender Studies 336. Grad students can take it as 894, and that's May 16th to June 3rd. It's a really fun and wonderful class. I'd love to see you there. Medieval Renaissance Studies does a lot of events. We're very, very proud of this one. On April 13th, in the Ubuntu room in the uh, Multicultural Center, Dustin Neighbors will be talking about Elizabeth I, and we encourage you to come to that. I also very much want to thank the Johnny Carson School of Theater and Film and the Department of English for their help in bringing us this wonderful speaker. And now, to introduce her, I'm turning it over to Professor Ian Gordon. I first knew Melissa as a scholar of Shakespeare, so I'm going to do the thrust stage thing and kind of come out here. Um, now, I noticed there's a lot more people here that we had earlier, so how many would like to uh, continue a little bit more about Shakespeare and should we can it? You had your chance! <laughs> now, how many in this room have read all of the Harry Potter books? Hand up. How many have seen all the movies? <coughs> What a bunch of nerds. <laughs> All right, now one more time. Who wants to see, hear about Torrance Shakespeare? Who wants to hear about Harry Potter? There we go. Fine, you're the <laughs> Harry Potter. Dr. <laughs> Melissa Aaron. Can you hear her at the back? There we go. All right. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Muggle technology. All right. So, um, yeah, it goes haywire around magical people. I don't know why. Um, anyway, um, I have a Harry Potter class. Um, I've been teaching Harry Potter in various different forms. I've also been um, I'm the academic programming chair at a Harry Potter con called Mysticon in um, New Hampshire, so I'm really steeped in this stuff. I even have a fandom name, which is Mooney Prof, which is just really sad. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, at my university, we're required to have learning objectives clearly demarcated in every course. Um, and I often tell my students that after one of my courses, they should be able to select correct object in a series of three, identify dragons using appropriate pragmatic strategies for coping with same, catch unicorns or no wins to ask someone else to do it and avoid a most painful death. <laughs> um, it's always important, by the way, to know who can catch a unicorn. This will come up later. Um, in relation to the Don Treader, used to start scrubs, is described as strong on statistics but weak on dragons. And I expect my students to be strong on dragons, and so I trust we'll you after this lecture. So this is, a this is a lecture on magical beasts. So the first question we, we want to know, what is a magical creature? Is it an ordinary creature used for magical purposes? Is it a, is it a creature with some magical properties? Or is it creatures that are entirely ma magical? That is, creatures that are entirely invisible to the muggle eye. Um, and so seemingly an ordinary creatures have some extraordinary magical abilities in the Potterverse. For example, owls must have the power of teleportation because they move really fast. They're able to read addresses. They're able to go to specific people. Um, and these are cats, by the way, um, in case you could not tell. 
Um, not enough people have talked about the cats in Harry Potter, I want to tell you. Especially in Order of the Speed of Phoenix, there's lots of, there's filled with spy cats. Spy cats. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Norris who's got, this seems to be like Argus Filch is familiar, really. She has all of the intelligence that Argus Filch doesn't really have. Um, uh, and there's also the, um, the foul kittens in Umbridge's office, or Patronus is a cat. Um, and it turns out, I was interested to find this out, she doesn't personally have a cat of her own. Real cats are <coughs> messy. She just likes pictures of kittens, which, is awful, right? Um, and uh, then there's my favorites, which are the cats raised by Mrs. Fig. Um, she sort of crossbreeds them with measles. And there's this great mar marvelous moment where she says, thank goodness Mr. Tibbles was on the job, right? <laughs> so, um, and there's another kind of animal that looks like um, cats, but they're really very bright. Um, uh, Crookshanks is probably measles. But we're going to stick today to the mostly magical creatures, um, or what Newton Scamander, who is the author of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, calls magizoology. Muggles call this um, cryptozoology. And I'm sure I understand they make some rather nice, interesting television programs about it. And of course, the laugh is on them because, according to Newton Scamander, all of these creatures are quite real. Right? And just in case you did not know what they are, um, they are, I can't seem to get this function quite right, is this it? Yeah. Um, anyone know what that is? Nessie. As Nessie, surgeon's photograph. That's a crocket, anyone know what this is? That is the Jersey Devil, my home state, right? The only state that has an official state monster, right? Um, and so there's some magical creatures that Rowling includes, but she renames them. Uh, Vila in Goblet of Fire. Um, they're probably based on the sirens in the Odyssey. Um, they have beautiful voices. They're, um, they attract in, you know, people like that. Um, in Fairy, um, who are animated corpses, seem to be pretty much zombies. But I think she stayed away from that because we already have a lot of preconceptions about what zombies should, should be like. Um, and uh, she also, fairies have received a whole lot of different, oh, oh that's right. Um, I, and so uh, there's another thing, which is that she likes to, oh yes, I want to make sure. By popular request, this lecture does include werewolves. We will be spending quite a lot of time on werewolves because that's my specialty. Um, let's see, did we get to this? There we go. Um, she also does some things that people don't expect necessarily. Um, fairies in rolling are not the sort of terrifying, uh, potentially, or cute little fluffy things. They are basically insects, and they lay eggs, and they are, you know, they have no particular intelligence at all. So that's, I think, an interesting spin on them, really. Um, so um, she does, so it's an intentional resistance against the image of fairies. And so she sort of uses that to create a distinction between the muggle world and the wizard world. There's the things that muggles think they are, and there's what we know they are, right? That's just something similar with, with gnomes, and she does something similar with mermaids, where you get to see it, um, the mermaids don't look anything like the pretty one in the bathroom of Goblet of Fire. Um, and so, um, but I'm going to stick with um, werewolves, of course. Werewolves are awesome. Um, now, bestiaries are book of beasts. Beasts. They have their roots in the natural natural histories written by Pliny and Aristotle, the man who knew everything. Um, and in the Middle Ages, they were often written and illustrated to il uh, illuminate some allegorical quality the animal supposedly possessed, rather than describe it accurately. Um, and to be fair, um, monks don't have access to documentaries narrated by Jeremy Irons, and so it's not surprising that they have ideas like lion cubs being born dead and then licked into life by their mothers um, after three days. You can see that they're using this as a parable for Christ, and then you know, after three days, and that the fact that it's not like really true isn't much of an issue. Um, so the best here is a book of beasts. You know, they have these beautifully illuminated things with these typological things um, relating them to the life of Christ. Um, this one, I believe, is in Aberdeen. Um, you can find it all online. Um, Gail Orpenfinger has a really fascinating um, article called. Um, uh, J.K. Rowling's bestiary, 
and it is on Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is the textbook that Harry uses for his Care of Magical Creatures thing. And so it's got his little notes with Ron, including a game of Hangman that doesn't work out, really. Um, but Newt Scamander, um, partly the idea that's the way she works it in is that um, Scamander's or Rowling's explanation as to why medieval and artists and writers knew them so well is because of the Clause 73 of the Statute of Secrecy. There are magical creatures that need to be withheld from muggle eyes. So part of withdrawing from the muggle world is taking certain kinds of magical creatures off of the map and that wizards are responsible for this. Um, and Rowling knows her medieval and renaissance literature and mythology quite well. I mean, you can see that throughout all of her books. She's really incorporating them very well. Um, well Fantastic Beast is the um, textbook. OK, there we go. Uh, Newt's Commander, um, the author of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, will hopefully be more photogenic in the movie that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, that will be coming out in November. I am already standing in line, right? Uh, as I said, this is the textbook used in Care of Magical Creatures. Um, and Scamander seems, based on his writings, to have been a steady, earnest worker. Um, Hufflepuff, by the way. Any, any Hufflepuffs in the audience? Or any Hufflepuffs? House Badger. Yep, absolutely. Um, and so his entries are low in sensationalism, and it's really a kind of a wonderful contrast where he's describing some terrifying magical creature and he's got it like um, lethifolds. Does anyone know what a lethifold is? Does anyone remember this at all? Do? They're supposed to be these flat little monsters. They're, they're dark, and they sort of look like a rippling cloak, and they sort of ease their way up on top of you. In, when you're sleeping, and then they sit on top of you and quietly digest you in their, your bed, <laughs> and then you're just gone. And that it's really rare to actually be killed by lethifold, but that people actually have been known to use lethifold death as a way of like sort of disappearing themselves. So it's really fun, right? So care of magical creatures instructors seem to be fearless and or blind to the dangerous qualities of the, the beasts they handle. So of course, um, there's Hagrid who thinks of everything as fluffy and cute. Um, but his predecessor, Professor Kettleburn, is the same way. He retires to spend more his time with his, more, his, relating, his remaining limbs, which if you read Beetle the Bard, you find out is one and a half. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's a whole thing about him introducing an engorged Eichwinder, which is a fire snake, into a dramatic presentation at Hogwarts. And so Scamander says that there's three divisions in the Ministry of Magic, there's beast, being, and spirit. And that beasts fold into certain kinds of things. There's some interesting things, which is it means that um, centaurs, who are certainly capable of being classified under beings, choose to be classified under beasts, because they don't think very highly of humans. So that's some sort of an interesting thing. Um, werewolves are split between the beast and being um, things, and that the werewolf registry actually was created by Newt's commander, who had some compassion towards werewolves, which is unusual, really. Um, we're not going to discuss spirits, which include poltergeists and things like that. We're going to stick with just straight out magical creatures, right? Um, Ministry of Magic Classifications. Um, Harry Potter, what is a beast? Harry Potter describes them as big hairy thing with too many legs. Um, although, of course, everything is not hairy um, or dragons aren't or has too many legs. Uh, Ministry of Magic Classifications. Um, known wizard killer, impossible to train or domesticate, or as Harry adds, anything Hagrid likes. <laughs> 4X dangerous requires specialist knowledge skilled wizard may handle. It doesn't necessarily mean they're dangerous, but phoenixes fall into category 4 because you have to be exceptionally skilled. Um, competent wizard may cope. Um, harmless may be domesticated, boring, flower worms, right? Um, and Rowling sprinkles her magical creatures all through the books, but you see the, the book that is really predominantly focused on them is book three, Prisoner of Azkaban. Because on one hand, one of the things that, that is when Harry first starts taking care of magical creatures, and it's also when we meet Professor Lupin, and so we get a lot of, we're introduced to Animagi, and there's a lot of stuff with that. 
Um, that's the dark, defense against the dark arts is taught by Lupin, which is kind of his specialty is dark creatures. And later we find out that he is a dark creature, so it sort of fits. Uh, but we're just going to stick to one or two popular ones. Dragons, seriously misunderstood creatures. Now, um, dragons are well known and they're frequently discussed. Um, I don't think you should dismiss them. Um, it's not healthy to dismiss a dragon. Um, now this one's extremely harmless. Anyone know who he is? Recognize him at all? This guy? Um, he's the reluctant dragon. The illustration <coughs> is by A.A. Um, by, uh, Milne. And um, he is very harm harmless and sweet and doesn't like company very much. And so his, what he's saying there to the boy is, now don't you hit me. Right, so he's, he's rather sweet. Um, and then there are, you know, other dragons, right? Um, I strongly recommend uh, Kenneth Graham's book. It's really sweet. Not the Disney movie, it's terrible, right? So he objects to the presence of boys. And then on the other hand, there's this guy. Um, yeah. Um, so um, you may recognize this gentleman, or at least his eye. Uh, could, you, could you, for some reason, this is just failing me. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Should be going. Is it? Yeah. Folks, the rollover on this is really, really dragged. Okay. That's all we've got. Excellent. Look, I'm afraid we had it before, unfortunately. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, anyway. And so this goes along with, with Faulkner. Um, anyone recognize this guy? Um, this is Smaug, of course. Um, he shares common material with Faulkner because Tolkien says that there's really only a couple of very interesting dragons. One of them is Beowulf, and one of them is Faulkner. Um, and so one of the things is Tolkien said that Wagner's treatment of Faulkner is a little bit slovenly. If you ever get a chance to sit through the whole ring cycle, which is like ring heads make Harry Potter heads just look like they follow ring productions all over the globe. Oh yes, I saw him in Sydney last year. Crazy. Fabulous though. And um, Faulkner in the opera is a giant who has acquired the ring of power and who can't think, and also all of the Rheingold, and he can't think of anything better to do with it than to turn himself into a dragon and sit on it eternally. And that's a major thing in dragon culture. Um, in Western culture, dragons represent demonic qualities, and particularly ferocity and greed. Um, and Rowling uses mostly Western dragon sources. Um, she gives a little nod to Chinese and um, Eastern um, depictions in the Chinese fireball, but that's it. We don't really get any d depictions of what they're like. Um, and in Beowulf, the dragon, which is referred to as a worm, begins his savage attacks when the thief steals a cup from his hoard. Um, and you see that in Smaug, too, where he knows everything <coughs> down to the last little coin in his hoard. Um, dragons don't use cups. They don't use anything that they're sitting on. They just want to have it. <laughs> And so they do represent um, miserliness, and from the cult in that culture, miserliness and greed is like one of the worst things that you can really represent. It, the entire culture depends on loyalty and gift, gift giving. You are loyal to your Lord in exchange for him giving you gifts. And therefore, you're supposed to share the wealth. And so anybody who just sits on a pile of wealth is just, you know, a major or class jerk, right? Um, 
And so Fafner, I mentioned him, uh, so the Lord is the gold giver. Um, and this is a little quote from Seamus, Seamus Haney, who did a translation of Beowulf fairly recently. A dragon is no idle fancy. Whatever may be his origins, in fact or invention, a dragon in legend is a potent creation of men's imagination, richer in significance than his barrow is in gold. Even today, despite the critics, you may find men not ignorant of tragic legend and history, who have heard of heroes and indeed seen them, who have yet been taught by the fascination of the worm. And that's a, and a quote from um, Tolkien, uh, Beowulf, the Monster, and the Critics, which is a great essay. Uh, and you can hear the fury and the greed behind Smaug in the text of Beowulf. Thaw the worm on walk, stonk after stana, feundest forlast, dirna crafta, hardware sota, gerna after grunda, thaw they him on swefota, right? So it's, yeah, I mean, Sarah Betota, sorry, I left off some of this, right? Okay, so it's, thaw the worm on walk, what was in Stonk as the first stand, stand forth on fat, feund is fat last. He the fourth gets stop, dear than crafted, drachen heft an egg. Hordeberg sotte, georn after blonde, waltz goon and finden, though they him sway footed saragatoto. So which is when the dragon awoke, trouble flared again. He ripples down the rock, writhing with anger when he saw the footprints of the prowler who had stolen too close to his dreaming head. The horde guardian scorched the ground as he scoured and hunted for the trespasser who had troubled his sleep. And that's the Shamus Haney translation. Um, and this is actually um, uh, Tolkien's own um, drawing of smell. Uh, there's Bilbo over in the corner, that tiny little um, guy there. Um, and this is the runes right there on the thing. So there's Smaug. Um, what Tolkien added was that Smaug is clever. In Beowulf, the dragon is not clever. It's stupid and greedy, and it sits on gold. Tolkien added sort of almost an Eastern element of cleverness to the dragon, and also some other elements as well. Um, Smell boasts a lot in a way, like more like a medieval hero. My armor is like tenfold shields, my teeth are swords, my claws spears, the shock of my tail a thunderbolt, my wings a hurricane, and my breath death. I'm sorry, I'm not Benedict Cumberbatch. I'll try. <laughs> um, and he also admits a, admits a kind of evil cunning. He's got a dragon spell that drag that pulls you in. Um, so he's, you know, he's, he's smart. Now, C.S. Lewis also depicts the dragon as emphasizing greed, although here it's a human. Uh, used as Clarence Scrubs, we referred to him before. Um, he's transformed into a dragon via greed. He falls asleep on top of a dragon's horde while well, he's thinking greedy thoughts like a dragon, and therefore he awaits to become a dragon. Um, yeah, sleeping on a dragon's heart with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart, he had become a dragon himself. When he thought of this, the poor dragon that had been Eustace lifted up, up his voice and wept. A powerful dragon crying its eyes out into the moon in a deserted valley is a sight and a sound hardly to be imagined. Um, dragons are also associated with the devil. In Spencer's Fairy Queen, Red Cross's quest is to defeat the dragon, who has taken a king and a queen, Adam and Eve, captive. It takes him three days to defeat him, in the course of which he falls backwards into a well and a kind of baptism. It's not subtle, really. <laughs> um, and Rowling has Newt's commander describe ten different species of dragons, and it's too bad we never get to see most of them. He's, one of them is the Australian opal eye, which sounds just terrifically beautiful. Um, she has an entire dragon arc starting from Baby Norbert, where the dragon plot is literally hatched, um, through the dragons in Goblet of Fire, and finally the, bla the blind dragon in Deathly Hallows. And it takes a special kind of wizard to deal with dragons. Only Hagrid could possibly think of them as cute and cuddly. Um, they're not intelligent, but they're still associated with greed. So it's not an accident that there's a dragon guarding the most important treasures in Gringotts. And it's also not an accident that the dragon is used to break out of Gringotts. It takes a dragon to do that. Um, but she also has another dra dragon, and you don't automatically think of him. There's the dragon, right? A blind dragon on the top of Gringotts, right? She has another dragon, and that's Draco. Because his name means that. The Draco, the Malfoys have slightly satanic names. They're named after constellations. Um, also, the Blacks are um, Regulus, Sirius, Andromeda. 
but um, they also have satanic names as well. Uh, sorry, how many people are really fond of Draco Malfoy? I know there are some. There are some intense Draco <laughs> fan girls, including Cassandra Clare, who went on to write The Mortal Instruments. Has anyone read The Mortal Instruments? The Mortal Instruments started out as her Draco trilogy when she was a fanfic writer. True stuff, so, didn't make it up, right? Um, and so the names like, Luci um, like Lucius, which sounds like Lucifer, um, Narcissa, that's Satan's main thing is pride or narcissism. If you read Paradise Lost, you have this thing where Satan falls in love with his own daughter, Sin, because she looks so much like him. It's really gross. And then they have a baby, which is death, and it's like the infernal trinity, yeah. Um, and so he, Draco has a very Spencerian name, Draco Malfoy, Devil Bad Faith. Gosh, wonder if he's going to be a good character. <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking of constellations, the constellation Monoceros, right? So let's move on to unicorns. Ups, wrong! <laughs> unicorns. Um, girls love unicorns, right? Unicorns love them back, as we'll see in a second. As I was saying, the unicorns. Um, now, you'll recognize this maybe as the wallpaper in Gryffindor Tower. Um, this is one of the Lady and the Unicorn tapestries at the Musée de Cluny. Um, and this is the culminating one, almost so this year. They're named after different senses, sight, taste, touch, hearing. And then the last one is this, where she is giving all of those things, all of her senses, over to um, the unicorn. It was a representation of Christ. That's the Horses and Clusus, the, um, the sealed garden. Um, so she's locking up her senses to the service of the unicorn, and she's devoting herself to purity. Um, you need a pure maiden to catch a unicorn. That is why I said you might need to get somebody else to do it. <laughs> um, and uh, because I, you know, if, if you need to ask somebody, I promise I will not ask any questions. But Professor Grobley Plank says that that's the way that's the way unicorns are. Many of the girls ooed at the sight of the unicorn. Oh, it's so beautiful, whispered Lavender Brown. The unicorn was so brightly white, it made the snow all around it look gray. It was pawing the ground nervously with its golden clothes and throwing back its horned head. Boys, kick back, or Professor Grubbly Plank throwing out an arm and catching Harry hard in the ribs. They prefer the woman's touch, unicorns. Now, Hagrid actually had some important information there when he reassumes his position as teacher, even though it was clear that he found their lack of poisonous fangs disappointing. Um, today, he had managed to capture two unicorn foals. Unlike field-grown unicorns, they were pure gold. And he adds that they turn silver when they're two, and they don't become pure white until they're seven. Um, and as far as I know, Rowling made that up. The starting as gold and then moving to silver and then moving to pure white. It's a really lovely little image, but that's that's her own touch, her own spin. Um, the unicorns only show up a few times in the Potter books. They're an important idea, but they only show up a few times. Cedric has a hair from the tail of the male unicorn, um, and it makes sense in the light of his character, although curiously so does Draco. And fairly recently, Rowling published something in which she said she wanted to suggest some ambivalence to Draco's character, that there might be a little core of goodness inside Draco, somewhere inside the wizard version of white supremacy and white privilege, right? <laughs> Personally, my feeling about Draco is I don't want to get close enough to find out, but you know, she, she does do this, right? Um, and then also you have the first book where it's a kind of blasphemy. Roman, Roman the centaur remarks, always the, the innocent are the first victims, and nothing is as pure and innocent as a unicorn. When Harry sees the dead unicorn, he thinks he had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Ferenc informs him that it's a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn. Uh, the blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenseless to slay, save yourself. Um, now, um, curiously, slaying unicorns or the unicorn and drinking its blood or capturing it is off, often the um, theme in its depiction. Um, notice the hunters all around it. Um, I don't like to show the death of the unicorn, even though it's plentifully illustrated in medieval lit because it's too sad. Um, but it's supposed to be, again, 
Christ-like typology, <coughs> that the unicorn has to be captured by a pure maiden, that it has to, that it, you kill it and you drink its blood, and the blood is salvific, and also that, like Christ, it doesn't stay dead, right? Um, so, you know, that's the way it is. Oh, and by the way, I couldn't find any good pictures of unicorns from Harry Potter. You know, they're important, but you don't really see them, except like it's dead legs. So this is going to have to do, I'm afraid. <laughs> there they are. I mean, there's Ron, Harry, and Hermione, so you know, that kind of works, right? So, so yes. So let's move on to werewolves, which is really the meat of this. Um, there's a significant difference between what werewolves are Everything you thought you knew about werewolves and we're at Rowling's werewolf mythology. Um, werewolves, what they are. These are from two um, Renaissance depictions. That's supposed to be a, an actual, you know, this is really what happened kind of thing, where you see the werewolf sort of a werehuman with a baby in its mouth. And, you know, they, they like to kill people. So this is what werewolves really are, right? Um, and uh, they simply, you know, and then there's what muggles think they are, right? <laughs> and this is a problem, because nowadays with, with paranormal romances being so popular as what they are, bookstores are filled with uh, inadvertent lycanthropic propaganda. So I feel it's my duty to tell you what werewolves really are, right? Beware. Um, and um, werewolves are traditionally part of the legendary story of Rom Rom Remus and Romulus, the founders of Rome. Um, and Romulus and Remus are suckled by, um, by, a, by a wolf, right, a she-wolf. And Lupin is named after the murdered brother. I think that's kind of uh, important. He takes Romulus as his code name in Deathly Hallows, so the Potter Watch thing. Um, werewolf just means man-wolf. Um, werewolves are therianthropes, which technically are skin changers, people who can turn themselves into animals. Um, in European legends, how does somebody become a werewolf? Does somebody say bitten? Does anybody know any other way? Ah, see, you needed this. You needed this lecture. You really <laughs> did. Um, where if European legends, there are various different ways you can become a werewolf, right? You can become a werewolf by drinking from a stream in which a wolf has walked. You can become a werewolf by smelling a lycanthropous flower. No, I did not make that up. You can become a werewolf when you're subjected to some kind of a curse. Um, you can become a werewolf either through some kind of hereditary curse or um, you know, by making a compact with a god or a demon. The one way that you will not become a werewolf is by being bitten. That doesn't happen until much later, right? And so most of the times, wolves and werewolves get lots of negative press. Uh, both the animal, animal and the human animal are synonymous with cruelty, ravenous hunger, and sexual rapacity. They're dangerous. There's nothing good about them, right? Not at all. So let's quick look back at this a little bit. Um, historical werewolves, um, they're not very nice, or they are mentally ill. Um, there are a number of cases in uh, <coughs> we actually call this clinical lycanthropy. You don't see so much about it anymore, in which somebody believes themselves to be a werewolf or to be a wolf. This shows up in Duchess of Malfi, where um, the Duke thinks that he has, that he is a wolf. Said he was a wolf, only the difference was a wolf's skin was hairy on the outside, his on the inside, bade them take up a sword, rip up his flesh, and try. So, you know, in that case, though, the Duke is becoming a wolf because he really is that kind of rapacious kind of person inside. And that, so in a way, when he goes mad, he becomes sane and realizes that, yeah, he's a wolf, a bad wolf. Except that during the 12th century, there's this sudden surge of stories of noble werewolves, wolves that are sort of under a curse, wolves that are, you know, sort of subjected to different kinds of betrayal. And the sort of locus classicus for that is Marie de France's Bisclavet in which there is a man who has this sort of curse. Um, his wife finds out about this. There, it's needed, do you have to have a magical garment? Has anyone seen The Secret of Roninish or any of these things? They're sort of silkies, very similar, where if you have the wolf hide or the piece of clothing, then the person can't transform back from the animal, right? So his, his wife finds his wolf skin realizes what he is, and then hides his clothing, so he's trapped as a wolf forever. And 
and he winds up running across the king. They're surprised at how gentle and intelligent and amazing this wolf is. He becomes a sort of a pet to the royal court, and then he comes face to face with his ex-wife, who is now with some other dude, and she jumps, he jumps up and bites her nose off. And, and then, you know, everybody realizes who he has to be, and he's cured, and nobody really cares about the fact that she's throwing all her noses off, because, you know, I guess she had it coming or something like this. Um, but they're really unusual portrayals, um, and they're pretty much gone by the 15th or the 16th century. Um, in England, the wolf was hunted to extinction. They had bounties on their heads. Um, and so that means that if you have a British werewolf story, it's sort of weird. Any werewolf story that's set where wolves don't naturally exist is sort of weird, right? Somebody comes along showing up as like a wolf. There's a wolf in downtown, you know, Los Angeles. What? Right? And so, but the thing is that in France, there are werewolf trials. They're just like witch trials, in fact. Um, their werewolves are, by definition, are witches. All the same stories of, I met somebody out in the woods, this man made me sign a book, um, he gave me these capabilities of cursing people and flying. The one difference is, he gave me the ability to turn myself into a wolf. Um, and so, pretty much, that's, that's the way that works, right? Um, werewolf stories appear, reappear in the 19th century, and they're part of that gothic movement that gives you vampire literature. Um, the signs of the werewolf are categorized by Sabine Baring Gould in, um, 1850, in 1865. And Dracula, Stoker's Dracula, uses a lot of them for his vampire. Now, we think of a lot of popular lit has vampires and werewolves on opposite teams. I mean, like opposite football teams, like they're totally different. Um, but everybody forgets about some of the vampire legends that are supposed to be connected with it. Have any, has any of you seen the old, you know, Bela Lugosi film? Mm. Oh, the children of the night, what music they make. He can call on wolves. He can turn himself into a wolf. So there is that vampires and werewolves aren't necessarily completely different. Another thing, a lot of qualities are kept from the original Dracula, but not that he has hair growing in the middle of his palm. And that's just something that is, miss that is now missing from vampire religion for whatever it is. So that's everything you know about werewolves. That's just a cute picture I put in there. Uh, that's also another one. Everything you know about werewolves is 20th century. And it's pop culture, and it comes from <laughs> Guy Andors, the werewolf of Paris, and the 1941 film The Wolfman, and Fra Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. In other words, Universal Pictures gave us werewolves. Right? It all begins here. Um, and succeeding retellings add layers to the mythology, although they usually undermine some other element of it. Um, so here we have, he's the one who gives us all these various different things. There's the, um, the sympathetic werewolf, too, almost a callback to the 12th century. There you have Larry Talbot, he doesn't want to be a monster. He wants to be a good person, and yet he has this curse on him, and, you know, it's just unfair. Um, this marvelous little thing where you've got the silver head of the cane with a, you know, a wolf thing, that, of course, becomes the lethal instrument that kills him eventually, and it's wielded by his own father, right? Um, so there's werewolf tropes in the Wolfman. Propagation by infection. That's where you got it from, the idea that when you're bitten by a werewolf, you become a werewolf. It's like, you can tell, it's taken from vampires. Um, the pentagram is the sign of the werewolf. Um, the werewolf must be killed by a silver object. Werewolves transform at the full moon. It's all in that arcane book over there. And the most important one, don't be ridiculous, right? Also, don't visit that pub. Um, so, you know, does anyone recognize this? This is the one in American Werewolf in London, right? Um, so they add new elements to it. So when I really picked this, American Werewolf in London has a pub scene where it's got lots of references to the wolf, uh, to the Wolfman, um, and yet when David, who is the werewolf of the, t of the title, is visited by his dead friend who tells him that the curse of being a werewolf is not going to leave and all the other people who have been killed by the werewolf aren't going to go to their rest until he dies and doesn't bite anybody else. And you're that, in other words, David, you're going to have to commit suicide. And David says, well, do I have to shoot myself with a silver bullet? And his friend goes, don't be ridiculous. 
right? And so the don't be ridiculous element is something that happens. So the werewolf, the, that movie brought us the idea that a werewolf has to be killed by someone who loves him. And that's carried over from the wolfman, and they never use it again. You'll notice in that list of various different things, like the pentagram being the sign of the werewolf, and some of those we do all the time, like infection by bite, everyone knows that one. Did anyone know that the <coughs> pentagram is the sign of the werewolf? Yeah, it's just it shows up in the wolfman and nobody picks it up. It's just for some reason. Um, and so in modern literature, you know, that they did use this in, um, that the werewolf has to be killed by someone who loves them, in the version of the new version of the Wolfman, which I'm probably the only person who saw it, um, but uh, that also has him have to be killed by someone who loves him. Um, so here's some contemporary werewolf <laughs> drugs, right? Lycanthropy is a disease. Um, the werewolf has to be killed by someone who loves them. Transformations are agonizingly painful. The eye of the wolf. Werewolves make for life. I hate that one. Um, <laughs> werewolves live in packs with alpha werewolves, and werewolves are hot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, werewolves must be killed by someone who loves one. We just really don't know. We picked up on that. Transformations are ag agonizingly painful. This really <coughs> has its genesis mostly in American Werewolf in London. If you have not seen that transformation scene, it's two minutes. And it also makes Rick Baker into the god of werewolf makeup, because that was all done before CGI, and it had to be all these different layers of crepe hair added to the actor. It's really um, incredible. Um, but the idea of every single body part, all of the bones of the body, every, every organ having to move and change, really comes from American Werewolf in London. Um, Rowling specifically said that she took her transformation sequence from that movie. That's where her idea of what it looks like for Lupin comes from. And um, that's also been, if you, any of you seen a, um, a television series called Being Human? Mm. There's an amazing description of what werewolf transformations are, where basically every single major organ goes into failure at once. You're having a heart attack and liver shut down and everything all at once, and that you'd scream except your throat is closing at the same time, and if you were a human being, you wouldn't live through it. And the person who says this is incredibly sadistic, and he says it's beautiful, right? <laughs> it's really horrible, right? Um, and there's those two kinds of werewolves, and there's sympathetic werewolves, there's the reluctant monster type, and then there's the Larry Terrible type. So let's look at what J.K. Rowling did to her mythology. The stuff she kept. Lycanthropy is a disease. Werewolves are created by being bitten. Um, werewolves transform at the full moon. Werewolf transformations are painful. And it's all in that arcane book over there. Something that happens in the Wolfman, and it happens in almost every single werewolf thing, is there's ye old book of werewolves. And they, the somebody, like usually the parish priest brings it down and it's all, you know, and it's got colored candle drippings. It's in the curse of the were rabbit. Seriously, they knew, they, Nick Park knows this trope, and so if you have a were rabbit, you have to have that too, right? Um, so there's always this ye olde um, book of werewolves, but of course, I just mentioned that this stuff doesn't start until the 20th century, so it creates this sort of illusion of some sort of continuity with the past that isn't really there. So she kept all that stuff. And her arcane book is, of course, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Coming out in November, a theater near you. Um, don't be ridiculous. Werewolves must be killed by silver. Uh, she's dropped the werewolves, bit and bear the sign of the pentagram. Uh, werewolves mate for life, werewolves in print. Don't get me started. Oh, don't, don't, don't get me started, werewolves make for life. Um, werewolf packs and alpha werewolves, those don't exist, although I found recently the idea that werewolves do live in groups and rolling, it's slowly becoming more evident that that's something that does happen, that they group together in these little groups, these little kind of clusters just for survival. But they're not like packs, right? And werewolves are hot. Um, the jury's still out on werewolves are hot, really. Um, what about the things she left out? Right? Well, now we know um, there's all the things that we all have all these questions about, those of us who care about this stuff. Um, Harry and his friends in book one study how to treat werewolf bites, but lycanthropy is incurable. Um, Hagrid raises werewolf cubs under his bed. There's a bit where Draco says, there's werewolves in the Forbidden Forest, right? Really? Um, and Lupin freaks 
freaks out about passing on his disease to his unborn son, which you can only become a werewolf by being bitten. Why is that? Um, frequent lycanthropic questions. Would she, she eventually cleared this up in Pottermore. What happens to a muggle who's bitten? The muggle usually dies. No problem. Right? It's wizards that usually survive it. Also, even though there is a werewolf registry and, registry and a werewolf capture and control unit in different sections, so that if you're a registry for you know, support services, then that's in the being division. But the beast division handles capture and control. Wouldn't it be great to have support services? No one's ever signed up for it. No one wants to out himself as a werewolf. So there's nobody who has ever registered the werewolf registry, even though that's something that Newt's commander created in an attempt to be more humane. Um, what about silver? Yeah, what about it? Um, it doesn't kill werewolves, but it can be mixed with dittany to treat werewolf bites. It just takes away the pain, it takes away some of the misery of it, but it doesn't cure them. So that's what Harry and his friends are studying. I was so relieved, you know, I worry about these things. Um, can lycanthropy be inherited? No. No, come on, no. <laughs> you don't mean Lupin was needlessly paranoid? Yes, he was. He was needlessly paranoid. There was never any chance that he would pass it on to his son. Now, Rowling said specifically that what she had in mind when she created Lupin, which was what many people suspected, is she was thinking about HIV, where there's lots of stigma, where it's particularly that it's a blood-carried disease and um, all of the things connected with this. And there's, you can see some of this having been absorbed by the fandom unconsciously without her ever explicitly having stated that. However, in her thing, werewolves can only be um, werewolves by being bitten. My theory about what this is about, Lupin is bitten as a small child. He's bitten by Fenrir Greyback, and it turns out that this was intentional. It was something that he used as a form of revenge against his father, who called werewolves soulless beasts. And Fenrir Greyback waited to bite this little boy, so now you'll know. Are you going to reject your own son? Um, that is what I think Lupin's really afraid of. It's not that he could pass it on, it's that he could bite his own child, which is, I can tell you right now, the specter that of every victim of childhood sexual abuse ever is that they could harm a child in the same way that they were harmed. And it doesn't, isn't helped by the sort of idea that for some reason somebody who has suffered this way would necessarily go on to become a perpetrator. It's this extra burden that's carried along. So I've always thought that there's this element with Lupin that he carries this fear of hurting children around with him and that it makes it very difficult, indeed impossible, for him to become a parent. This is the one thing she didn't solve up. Werewolves in the Forbidden Forest. And I'm just going to read you this. One curious feature of the condition is that if two werewolves meet and mate at the full moon, a highly un unlikely contingency which is known to have occurred only twice, the result of the mating will be wolf cubs which resemble true wolves in everything except their abnormally high intelligence. Such a litter was once set free under conditions of extreme secrecy in the forbidden forest at Hogwarts with the kind permission of Albus Dumbledore. Um, and it grew, comes grow to beautiful and unusually intelligent wolves, and some of them live there still, which has given rise to the story about werewolves in the forest. Stories none of the teachers or the gamekeeper has done much of this battle because keeping students out of the forest is highly, highly desirable. So there are werewolves in the forbidden forest. They are this result of this very unusual situation. Um, final note on wolves and Remus Lupin from J.K. Rowling. Um, this is her own words. Remus Lupin was one of my favorite characters in the entire Potter series. I made myself cry all over again while writing this entry because I hated killing him. Remus's Patronus is never revealed in the Potter books, even though it is he who teaches Harry the difficult and unusual art of producing one. It is, in fact, a wolf, an ordinary wolf, not a werewolf. Wolves are family-oriented and non-aggressive, but Remus dislikes the form of his Patronus, which is a constant reminder of his affliction. Everything wolfish disgusts him, and he often produces a non-corporeal Patronus deliberately, especially when others are watching. 
So this is a character who is in some ways enormously admirable and at the same time um, filled with um, self-hatred. And somehow he's just my favorite character, the ultimate teacher, really. Um, and that's why I think the character really appealed to me and why I started doing this research. It was that was it, everything. So mischief managed. And I just wanted to, has anyone got a question? Yes. And why don't you go up and use the um, mic up there oh. so everyone oh, yes, can hear the questions? Please do. Yep. And so I'm kind of going back to the unicorns and the sure. um, tapestries that are with like the cloisters right now. Um, so I know that the unicorn in captivity is in the room of requirement in one of the movies, um, and the Gryffindor common room yep. has those. Are there other like kind of Easter eggs, I guess, of medieval? Uh, like, no. Oh, you mean of, of unicorns specifically? Well, also like any like. Images from manuscripts you might have found on any of the other beasts, do they come up in the castle? Like things that are just overlooked or missed? Jeez. Well, the one that really um, sticks out to me because it showed in the little, the little um, slideshow that Snape does of werewolves, he has a little slide coming up and it's a Vitruvian man with a, with a wolf head. Um, but I'm trying to think, you know, the thing is, that's, those sets are incredibly dense. I went to Leeston, where they filmed a lot of it, and there are details you will absolutely, I guarantee you, never, ever see. The only reason why I had that picture of Newt's commander was because he's identified as that under one of the, uh, on the portraits in Dumbledore's office. But yeah, so I'm sure they're there, but I just don't even know about them, if that makes any sense. Other questions? Please do. How? Yes, sure. Um, do you want to come down and use the mic? Can I just talk loudly? Sure, please, um, go ahead. I'd rather have questions than each not. Of the, each of the houses has that particular animal associated with it. Yep. How did the characteristics of that animal fit with that house? Oh, I'd love to answer that question. Um, the four houses are modeled on the four elements. So Gryffindor is associated with fire, and Slytherin is associated with water, and Ravenclaw is associated with air, and, um, and uh, Hufflepuff is associated with earth. So looking at all of them, the lion is sort of a, the royal beast, right? And it sort of makes sense there. It's sort of the image of courage. I mean, even the cowardly lion, as that's the one thing a lion has to absolutely have is courage, right? Um, and, and as I said, it's a royal animal. There's the lion on one side and the unicorn on the other side and the British seal. Um, the um, ravens are known as being particularly bright, although the image of Ravenclaw is actually um, an eagle. So go figure, right? Um, Slytherin's a snake. And that's the thing is snakes don't necessarily go with the water. Some of them do, but most of them don't. Um, but her depiction of snakes, it's very traditional, bad types of stuff. If you count through, looking at the dragons, if you count basilisks and snakes in that, there's something like that in almost every single book. But let's talk about badgers, because I actually came out as a Hufflepuff in my uh, bottom one test, and I feel they're severely underrated. Um, badgers actually live in sets. They're social animals. But in British literature, they usually aren't. In British literature, they're solitary. So there's a couple of other badgers that show up. Uh, Mr. Badger in um, Wind in the Willows is solitary um, and sort of a bit bookish. Um, and that they're stubborn and ferocious as well. Um, Truffle Hunter in, um, in Prince Caspian. It's like everybody forgets, but we beasts don't forget that the badger is sort of the ultimate loyalist, the one who has dealt himself in and will not let go of Aslan. And then the other one is, um, dang it, dang it, dang it. Um, um, I'm losing this one particular. Oh, yes, T.H. What? Um, Sword and Stone. Um, there's, um, Arthur gets turned into all these different animals where he's turned into a bird, he's turned into a fish. And his very last one, he goes and visits the badger. 
and the badger is, re is, is a bit of a scholar, a bit of a bachelor. He likes to live by himself and he reads all of this stuff. It's sort of the last lesson that the work gets. So these are all characteristics that are associated with badgers, this sort of loyalty, stubbornness, kind of being rooted in the earth, also fond of a good meal. So what's not to like, right? <laughs> uh, but they are all heraldic animals, yeah. So other questions? Beasts, my favorite thing to talk about, yeah. Um, so you say that a lot of times she just kind of makes that, a lot of times she does use mythology and such uh, mm -hmm. in history, but a lot of times she just makes it up. Oh yeah. Um, what way does she lean in her use of giants, especially with Hagrid's brother? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Giants. Wow. I think her <coughs> giants are sort of Norse giants, actually. <coughs> They're very similar to the way they're depicted in Ring of the Nibelungen and in, um, and in uh, C.S. Lewis, whom she's obviously pulling from a lot. They're supposed to be not very bright. I'm not quite sure exactly where that idea comes from, but the idea that they're not very bright. I mentioned Fafner, who turns himself into a dragon. One of the things about Fafner is he's actually killed his own brother to get the right power. But he's not smart enough to think of anything to do with it, so he just sits on it, right? I mean, it's really sad. I really recommend Faulkner. Faulkner is very cool. Um, uh, Mimic he'll, um, sends Siegfried, the, the boy born without fear, off to kill Faulkner. And there's this moment where Faulkner says, well, I came out to take a drink, but now I think I'll have a snack. And as he's killed and as he's dying, he says to Siegfried, child, who told you to come kill me? Whoever told you that is not your friend. <laughs> and that's his last comment on that. But that's really, I don't know much about the giants. They're interesting, though, because there are several characters who are a combination of human being and some other kind of magical being, like Fleur. Everybody used bips over Fleur, but Fleur's part Vila. Right? And you wonder, is there like some kinds of magical creatures that are okay to marry and some that aren't? Um, I'm pretty sure that Flitwick's supposed to have Goblin in his background. This is why he's so short. He's not just a human being who isn't very tall. He's actually part, um, it's either House Elf or, or Goblin, but I'm pretty sure it's Goblin. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that those characters then get a lot of the prejudice directed at them. Not so much Flitwick, but like Hagrid, who has to deal with this sort of, oh, you're a giant, you're terrible. When Hagrid, Hagrid is like his creatures, he thinks everything is fluffy and sweet, right, including his own brother. Um, and it's the same thing with Fleur, who on the one hand, you know, has a lot of Vila characteristics, but it turns out that she's also, you know, really kind of cool. We don't find that out until the second, but she really is. Did that answer your question? It probably wasn't very helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? My favorite thing to talk about. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question um, going back to the um, the house animals. Mm -hmm. How come? How, why do you think that um, Rowling chose to choose animals that had nothing like in common with each other when like they're all like together united at Hogwarts? Like all these all the houses are their animals are so different they don't like naturally like go together. Well, this is I think getting back to the idea of them representing the four elements. And it answers the question, why is there still a Slytherin house? If they're all so terrible, why are they still there? And that's because you can't have a world that's made up of only fire, air, and earth. You can't have to have this fourth element that makes everything fit. So I think it's the, the idea that they're so different is why you have them all together. Does that make sense? I mean, and I feel like Hufflepuff gets kind of a, you know, not much respect, really, which is too bad. Um, among other things, um, in the division where it says each one of the four founders will take a certain group of, of students, um, Slytherin picks the ones of great ambition, and um, um, Gryffindor takes the ones who are brave, and Ravenclaw takes the ones that are all clever, and Hufflepuff says, I'll take the lot and treat them just the same. Every Hufflepuff I knew, now that everybody is like Pottermore, so they all are told what they are, but back when I first started teaching it, 
everybody's self-sorted, you know, they all, do, and I can tell you this, people who self-sort into Hufflepuff, they are hardcore, because they're heavy-duty fans, right? Nobody who's just sort of a casual is going to decide that they're a Hufflepuff. And the people that, and I did a sort of a house feast kind of thing, the Hufflepuff table was the smallest. And every single one of them was in K through 12 education. <laughs> and when each of the houses said, well, what's good about my house? They just said, well, we try to be good. You know, and I was like, and I actually, I went and sat down with them because there weren't as many of them. And I felt like that was fair. And I didn't realize that the fact that I went to sit with them because that was fair <laughs> meant that I really did belong there. <laughs> right? so, so yeah, I think it's a question of balance. Even the characteristics that don't seem nice are, are useful. Um, Phineas Nigellus at one point, who I think is a really classical Slytherin, says, now this is my problem with you and you young people and you Gryffindors. You want to go tearing off doing some brave, stupid thing. We're brave, but we at least think to use our heads first, right? We, and I always think of the uh, Slytherins as being the sort of CYA um, house, you know, to cover yourself, you know, make sure that you're, you know, I'm not going to go dig, going into there. Make sure I get paid fairly. Not a bad characteristic, necessarily. They probably wandered a little bit away from beasts, but that's why. You have to have a beast who belongs to each element to make it work. Mm -hmm. What about the name Hogwarts? Hogwarts. You know, it's funny. I remember somebody mentioning, saying, well, she invented all these fabulous names, uh, Hogwarts. Like, no, she did not. It shows up in a book in Molesworth, which is um, a set of um, humorous British school novels by Geoffrey Willens. And you either like that stuff or you don't, but ho the Hogwarts is a play in Latin that Molesworth writes, and it's really stupid. But <laughs> because it's a British school story, I wouldn't be surprised if it was written during the 1950s. I would not be surprised at all to find out that Rowling knew it. So yeah, Hogwarts originally comes from that. Yes? I was wondering if you could talk about the mythological basis as to why a basilisk would be killed by a rooster's crow and why spiders flee from them. Ooh, spiders fleeing from them, there's no bestiary explanation for that. But the crow of the rooster, since they are made by being hatched, right, a snake's egg under a chicken, it would make sense that a rooster would be associated with, you know, killing it, right? That it's also basilisks are sort of creatures of the night. They live in the dark. They crawl, they crawl through your plumbing. I mean, you're sort of thinking, I never want to go into the bathroom again. That's just like the scariest thing. It's like worse than alligators in the drains, right? Um, and that the thing that would destroy it is sunlight, you know, in a sort of a way, something. Um, Hamlet. There's a bit in Hamlet where it says ghosts can't appear, they disappear at cock crow. And there's this thing where it's Christmas time, this bird of, of this bird of and sings all day and sings all the time long, so blessed and so holy is the time. It sounds awful. If you've ever been near a rooster farm and you've heard them like not shut up, it's just like, please kill me now. So I don't know why it's so great in Hamlet, but I think that's it. They're connected with dispelling evil. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. One more question. We can make it a good one. Yes? Why not use magical, uh, mystic, mystical, magical beats for the house animals? That's a good question. I think they have to be sort of ordinary. <coughs> I think it just sort of makes sense if they're ordinary, um, particularly Hufflepuff. <laughs> um, there are things that they could be, right? Um, but I think they're supposed to be heraldic animals. And you know, there's a bit in Sword in the Stone. How many of you have read The Once and Future King? I highly recommend it if you haven't. Um, that there's a bit where Arthur is finally pulling the sword out of the stone. And all of these looks up and he sees all of the heraldic animals on the flags. And it's, it seems to him as though each one of them is encouraging him, including the badger. And um, he hasn't met a lion, but like some of the others, they're all like the hawks. And all of them are sort of encouraging him, like it's the pike of all strange things. So they're really, I think, 
she's using them as heraldic beasts, and that that is probably connected with Sword in the Stone. I've never gotten a solid confirmation that she's read it, but I would be really surprised if she hasn't, right? And there's lots of echoes of T.H. White, um, really a lot of echoes of T.H. White. I think that's really going to have to be it, because we're getting on towards what is it? It's it is important to We've this. gone over an hour, so yep. I think we need to give Professor Ahrens a great round of applause.